Hello again and welcome to another Morning Glory bolt action video. In today's episode, we shall be casting our ever critical eye over another bolt action unit. This time, we are heading over to the land of freedom and democracy and, of course, firepower. It's time for the United States of America to roll forth with one of their biggest tanks, the M26 Pershing. With its big gun and thick armor, the Pershing was the terror of the Tiger tanks. Well, at least that's how it was in real life. But what about in bot action? How does this vehicle translate onto the tabletop? Well, there's only one way to find out. It's time to take a look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of this US heavy tank. As is tradition, let us begin with a brief overview of what the hell this unit actually is. Like with many units in bot action, the Pershing has a variable points cost depending on what level of veterancy you wanted to have. At inexperience, it will cost 316 points, at regular, 395, and at veteran, it will cost 484 points. Of course, the advantage of Veteran is that your unit will have a higher leadership and in the case of armored vehicles, will be able to ignore any pins caused by weapons with a pen value that can't actually hurt the tank. For example, if someone tries to shoot your Pershing very foolishly with an anti-tank rifle, if it's Veteran, then it just ignores that. Even though it's got a pen value, because it can't physically get through its armor on the front, you don't have to worry about the pin that this thing might suffer. If you go for regular, your leadership is down the middle. It's leadership nine, and you still get to ignore some of the pins, but you do have to roll a four plus to see if the crew can recognize that that was a round that couldn't actually hurt them. If you go for an experience, you're going to save a lot of points. In fact, there is... Uh, almost 170 points difference between an inexperienced Pershing and a veteran one. The thing is, your leadership is going to be very low. Leadership 8, and your crew will also have a minus 1 to hit, and they won't be able to ignore any pins with a pen value. So even if someone hits you with something that can't hurt your tank, provided it's got a pen value, so small arms like rifles wouldn't count for this, you will take a pin on your tank. And bear in mind that you've got low leadership. That is a lethal combination. And that's because in bot action, for every pin that you have on your vehicle, your leadership is lowered by one again. So you start off at leadership eight with an experience. The moment you take one pin marker, that goes down to leadership seven, which means 50% of the time your unit isn't going to do as it's told. And then if you take two pins, you're down to leadership six and you are going to be forced to rally that unit, which will take it out of the fight. Overall, I think if you are going to take an expensive unit like the Pershing, you need to avoid inexperience. There's no point in taking a big unit and having it be useless because it makes it cheaper relative to a veteran one, but it's still a heavy investment, especially in a standard sort of 1,000 point, 1250 point game. If you are playing in that sort of single platoon, 1250, 1000 point area, you probably want to stick to this thing being regular. It will cost a lot of points, but you'll still just be able to fit in everything else that you need. Regardless of what veterancy you go for, every Pershing comes equipped with a gyro stabilized turret mounted super heavy anti tank gun with coaxial MMG and forward facing hull mounted medium machine. Being a heavy tank, the Pershing does have a damage value of 10 plus, making it resistant to most forms of light anti-tank. That includes things like your aforementioned AT rifles, heavy machine guns. It's also going to make you a bit, pretty much immune to low velocity light anti-tank guns like the which the Japanese like to use on their hard goes and stuff. It's also going to make you immune to a lot of different howitzers, which tend to max out at pen plus three or pen plus two some of them the really heavy ones are pen plus four uh, and also it's going to make you pretty much immune on the front armor to light at guns that are firing over half range where things start getting a bit dicey is when you start being targeted by medium anti-tank weapons and above your pershing will probably still be able to take a medium at on the front take it on the chin but there is a chance that that shot could knock you out. It could glance your armor, it could set you on fire. 
And when you start getting into heavy AT, yeah, you are definitely going to be in trouble. So it's a big beast with big guns and some decent firepower, but it ain't invincible. In terms of special rules and extra options, the Pershing is actually pretty straightforward. There's no special rules like you find on the Sherman, like thin sides or easy to catch fire. Nothing like that whatsoever. And the only weapon option you have is a pintle mounted heavy machine gun, which will cost you 25 points. Now that covers the overview of the Pershing, and we have actually dipped our toe into some of the tactics and done a bit of analysis along the way as well. But now let's get ready for the deep dive. Let's get into the nitty gritty of this unit. The first thing to mention is it's expensive. This ain't a Sherman. This isn't something you can just spaff in your list and it's medium tank, medium AT. It'll be able to take a little bit of everything on. You're gonna have plenty of points left over for you know everything else. This is a heavy tank and it costs the same as the German Tiger. And so the same rules really apply here. You will be able to have a Pershing and probably get a few units of infantry and you'll be able to just about squeeze everything in, but it's going to be tight and you are more than likely going to have to cut corners. For example, when I use a Tiger with my Germans, I end up taking a lot of inexperienced infantry like Volks Grenadiers. The funny thing is that the Americans don't really have that luxury. A lot of your American units and American infantry tend to be regular or veteran, especially when you start getting into the late war. And remember, this is a late war vehicle. It was the first 20 Pershings hit Europe in 1945. And there was some use in the Pacific in Okinawa but that's it. There were loads of them. This isn't like a Japanese tank where they made 20 of them and it never saw combat. They made almost 1,500 of them and they definitely saw combat. But it's late war. And if you have a look at a lot of the late war American units, for example, you've got things like your uh, Marine squads mid to late war. They have to come as veteran. And if you also have a look at your paratroopers, they have to come as veteran. If you start having a look at some of your regular infantry, you can take you can take inexperienced infantry squads, but if you read the sort of rules around it, it says when Royal American troops first deployed in action in North Africa, they didn't prove particularly reliable. This quickly changed the troops and commanders gained combat experience. Or even later in the war in Europe, because units were kept fully manned by the flesh supply. Oh shit, man. If you go through and look at your different infantry options, your regular infantry squad early and mid war, your regular infantry squad late war, these are all uh, regular or they're veteran choices when you start to get into paratroopers and the Marines and stuff. You do have the experience to take an inexperienced infantry squad though. And the rules right spot action have explained how the first troops were pretty inexperienced, but they kept refreshing the units with raw recruits. So you can take some experienced ones, but their options are very limited. You can have an NCO with machine gun and one BAR and that's it, which it's not like with the Germans where you get inexperienced troops and then they just come full of firepower. If you're going to be playing as the Americans, you are going to have to find those points somewhere to accommodate the Pershing. And if you do go down the inexperienced infantry squad route, just fleshing out your ranks of one or two units, they're not going to be bringing the same level of DACA that other factions can get from their inexperienced soul. Another thing with the Pershing is it will be your focal point. It will be the leg which your list is standing on. It's not like running a Sherman where if it dies, it dies. No, like you need to keep this thing alive. It needs to be slinging out those super heavy AT shells left, right and center. It needs to be hitting people with the big blast. It needs to be hitting tanks with the big punch. Fortunately, the Pershing has everything it needs to get that job done. The super heavy anti-tank gun, I can attest from personal experience, is an absolute beast. It is a weapon and a half. I've used this thing to put shells through the front of a vehicle and out the other side. When you've got a heavy tank with a super heavy, nine games out of ten, you are going to have the biggest, baddest tank. And unless someone has brought something truly meme-worthy, like they're turning up with a King Tiger or something like that, you are going to have armor superiority. 
And that's going to be a good feeling. It's going to be a novel feeling for a lot of allied players to have. Normally, that is the domain of the German players. But being able to beat them at their own game is not only fun, but also actually tactically important. It's going to change the dynamic of the game. And if you're ready for that dynamic change, then you'll have an advantage. But your opponent might not fully appreciate they don't have the armor superiority anymore. And that might cause them to make a few mistakes or a few bad judgments until they realize what the new situation actually is. An extra point on the Pershing's weapons is the combination of having a big gun, but also having several machine guns on backup is really, really good. Sometimes your enemy is gonna be dug into cover. And as much as you want to put a three inch blast into the infantry unit, it's gonna be hit on sixes followed by sixes. And you're probably going to miss and really you need to be getting a pin or trying to fish for a kill here and there being able to have two medium machine guns do that and maybe even a heavy machine gun on top of that will give you 13 rounds of daca if you are going sixes by sixes you're still going to need a bit of luck on your side but it's much more reliable than just hoping that big shot goes off so it's got nice flexibility on its weapon systems. A little side note though, it's important to remember that the gyro stabilized turret only works if you take it as Vectrum. So it, it always is a turret weapon, it always can fire 360, but the gyro stabilize is the American Army special rule and it means you can move and shoot the tank without penalty. But you only get to do that if it's a Vectrum tank. So if you've got a regular Pershing, if you move it, it's still going to suffer that minus one to hit. Oh, and speaking of little things that may catch you out, going for the Pindle HMG is probably a good idea, but it will make the tank a bit more expensive and it's already pretty pricey. But most importantly, it is Pintle, which means when you fire it for the rest of the turn, the tank counts as open topped, which is horrendous. You fire your Pershing early on and then someone starts pinging rifle rounds into it, it'll take the pins. If you've got the HMG and you use the Pintle HMG. The way you want to use this thing is to wait until the end. Let your other units go or put it in a position where it's not going to get any incoming small arms fire. And so when all of the other units have gone or when there's no threats or any of the dice that can really activate around it. Then you can unload with the Pintle and get maximum firepower from this thing. But just be careful with going with it too early because you could easily end up catching a few stray pins and... On an expensive vehicle like that, that's the last thing you want to happen. But we've really got into the nitty gritty there, getting down to the individual weapons and how you should use them. Let's take a step back for a moment and look at a big picture item, which is this is a heavy tank. And it is one of the few that you get as Americans. Off the top of my head, the only two I can think of are the Pershing and the Jumbo Sherman. That's it. And the Jumbo Sherman is good. But there's a whole number of reasons why you might not want to field it, such as it was relatively low numbers, it was a bit of a stopgap measure, it's got its own disadvantages with it being a Sherman and it being way more armor than it should be, so it's a bit slow and all that kind of stuff. And the guns aren't as powerful. Really, when we're talking about a proper heavy tank, something that's a heavy tank with a big gun, you've only got one option, and that is the Pershing. And so taking advantage of that... And having that tool in the toolbox is definitely something you want to be aware of as an American. Normally in this game, you're going to be constantly fighting upwards in the tank department. You're either going to have tank destroyers, which are going to have good guns, but light armor. Or you're going to have one of several million variants of Sherman, which all really boil down to a medium tank with a medium gun. Some have got heavy guns, but basically it's a medium tank in one form or another, right? And that often means that either you don't have the arm advantage or you don't have the gun advantage. But the Pershing brings it all. And yeah, you got to pay for it. And yeah, bot action is primarily an infantry game. But having that heavy tank, having a true heavy tank at your disposal is a very, very valuable asset and certainly one that you don't want to overlook. Overall, I think the Pershing is a pretty good tank. It's not meta but it is a proper heavy tank and it comes with all of the advantages and disadvantages that that brings. But of course, all of this is just like my opinion, man. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Are you a fan of the Pershing 
or do you find it a bit expensive and you always end up going for that Sherman or something a bit lighter instead? If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to smash that like button and also subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more during glory full-time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patreons these are the war masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. So a heartfelt thank you to Alex Dengal, Bon Bon Vert, Mad Larkin, Marcus Roberts, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, Try Again Bragg, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox and August Barney. Seriously, guys, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your support is incredible and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Hope you've all enjoyed today's video. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.